Yeah, collect cards and, and... What is it? Okay, oh, guys, so... It's 100 pounds a square foot? Yeah. That was a good little record, I'll tell you. There was, the, there was a, an avalanche of yawns going on here. Another one on one. And that lasagna was damn good. <laughs> one on one. And if I, we bought some pillows and blankets, if we all be rolling in the side over here, and the little car was getting it's that little quick afternoon nap. These, these six-hour courses, they're pretty tough and they're pretty tight, but you know, like anything else, the the example here is to keep the information fresh and keep going. So you, you're learning more about fire safety than anybody else. The question is, how do you use this information for the next guy? And that is why we record it, we put it online, start creating classes uh, and or part of your training for all the new recruits. All the, um, you know, through the fire chief, through the training officer. So in the, in the city of Elizabeth, which we're going to feature very shortly, we did 400 trainees in a week. And we only gave them a one hour class. Okay? And the one hour class is basically to make them aware that they're the additional eyeballs in the field to find these things through a lot of their training. So the very guys that are going to change everything are the very guys that are going to be using this video to train from home. You know what I'm saying? And they're just going to watch and see the, the issue with fire skips because they're going to be the people that are going to carry the torch forward when you guys are no longer pushing this issue forward. Okay? So that's why we record this. We can, you, you know, a lot of the YouTube channels, you have a download button. You hit download, you can actually download it onto your hard drive. So, as you know, a lot of your cities, <laughs> they stop access to the, to the YouTube and to the internet because uh, you know, we were using it for the wrong reasons back then. But now, um, just be aware, so you can, any of these videos you see, hit the download button, it'll actually download a hard drive version of it, you can burn it to a CD, and that way you can just watch it at any of your monthly training classes. Just have your guys watch this. And like I said before, get, your, get the recruits to be the guys walking the downtown alleys. Firescape watchers, they're the spotters. Got it? It's a great thing to basically, and they're going to say, why am I doing this? You say, because that's, you know, you either have that permanent structure, which is an escape structure, or the ladder that comes on the truck is an escape structure. Pick one or, or both. But they're both, you're going to have confidence in both. And because we test these in case anything goes on with these trucks, we're going to test these to make sure that you know that. You know, when people are getting out of these buildings, you're not helping. They're self-evacuating. They're out by themselves. They don't need you. But as we get in or get out of these buildings, we can use these things because we have that big white sticker on them. And they say they're fine. Got it? So you need to start letting the people at the beginning stages know that this is, this is uh, very important to them. All right, so now let's take a look inside here. This is how fire escapes are built. So if you look inside here, every fire escape has been built this way. We're going to end up on cantilevers and ladders. We're going to talk about, so when you start looking on the inside, this is how every fire escape has ever built for 100 plus years. None of them have built any different than this, okay? So let's take a look at this. All steel that goes into a building only goes in 8 to 12 inches deep, guys. That's it. It doesn't go two feet deep in your building. 8 to 12 inches deep. So if you put a lot of pressure on this that doesn't have a brace, what's going to happen in this area? If you put all the pressure there, right? It's simple physics. It'll blow out that cement, right? So when you lose a bracket or you lose a leg to the ground, what happens to that structure that's still up in the air? You know, you load it incorrectly, that's when it falls. Otherwise, it'll support itself. But if you put people and elephants on there, what happens? Okay? So this is how every fire escape support starts. They open a hole in the wall in 1910, they stuck this steel in there, and then they packed it with cement. That's it. That hole has to be so far in based on the size of the... 8 to 12 inches deep. That's it. No matter how sized the... No matter how sized. Really? Your brick is only 3. Your, your, your wall... Your typical wall on it is two or three courses of red brick, done. A factory, yeah, the pig factories you guys had out here, they're like two to three feet of wall because it was all self-supporting. Don't forget, a lot of these structures that we're talking about, a lot of them had steel girders that was the makeup. So everything made that basically the steel held up the building. The, the dirty brick on the inside and the veneer was, was just that. But factories, yeah, some of your mills and stuff, yeah. 
I think, I think but it's still I, only buried so deep. I think right. the reason I was thinking that is because, like, say an apartment house, if you have a balcony, so depending on the size of the balcony, third, the, the yeah. stringers have to... No, that's a different thing. That's a self-supporting sea channel. That's not okay. what I'm saying here. All, right. yeah. all fire escapes only different. go into the building 8 to 12 inches deep. You get a self-supporting um, waiting balcony. You're talking about even with 2x12s uh, or whatever, there's so much into the building and only so much sticking out to one-third, right. two-thirds rule or whatever it may be. Right. Uh, girders and i beam, same thing, yeah. So if all of a sudden it's a self-supporting C channel that sticks out only four feet, you may have three feet into the building right. tied back. That's correct. Okay. But a standard fire escape built for 100 years plus only goes 8 to 12 inches deep. Wow. And, and even yes. some of the balconies from that era as well only went Everything. 8 to 10 inches. It didn't matter. Everything. Those changed one-third, two-thirds in progressive time. So when we hit like 1950, 1960, they started for over balconies and for for cantilevered porches and stuff like yeah. that. That's when that happened, was in the 50s But no, 60s. nobody's doing cantilevered fire escapes. There's a few out there, but every every fire escape, 98% of all the fire escapes are not cantilevered fire escapes. They're all uh, support uh, fire escapes. So this is what it looks like. So that one has a bracket on it, right? Yep. This one has no bracket on it because somebody took it out and then we put it back. This single one is holding two staircases that are falling already, right? Yet, somebody took out the bracket that belonged here. So it's only a matter of time when people, firemen, and things sitting on this edge here does what? He's got to rip this whole staircase right. out of the wall. Got it? That's no good. So, so what you're looking at is this is what stops those singles. It's this bracket here mm -hmm. that's going to give it all the support. By the way, a lot of times you see across a building a lot of singles, right? And then all of a sudden, there's just one or two brackets towards the ends. You know what's holding up all the singles in the middle? The railing is acting like a truss. So the truss is the railing holding up all the singles that tie in on the ends with the brackets. And then the only reason that the, the brackets go out and tie into the rail is to hold up the grating. But the span, the truss, is a rail. Master's degree in reverse stupidity. Then they've done that. So that's why. So a lot of the stuff you'll learn after a while. And this is coast to coast, guys. So there's been no changes in fire escape building, coast to coast. So a lot of these brackets have a single bolt or a gusset, and they always tie back into the building. And this is what they do. They'll throw water in there. Ice jacking and rust jacking does what to cement? Spalls it. We got to repack. Inside, the through bolts, a lot of factories will have this issue. Yeah. The, the spacers on the inside are too small. And what, what do they do to the individual bricks? Pull them right through, though, too much pressure. So it has to be a bigger plate. Got it? It'll squish right in. You got enough water growing on a, on a building, what's going to happen? Moisture. Burns, brick porous. Moss. So a lot of times what you see from above is not what's really happening from down below. You keep feeding it water. This is one inch of rust, three quarters to one inch of rust on a, on a library in Boston. So for those of you that are still growing some of the exotic ferns that are now being legalized in America, fire escapes. Okay? You can do it. So there's another way to get a fire escape. So every now and then we have a situation where we have a bad, a bad situation and the brackets are not, you know, you're not comfortable with the wall, put a leg on it. But there's another way that all the legs to the ground sit on a sauna, three to four feet below the frost line. Okay? So that's the only other way. If you don't do a bracket to the wall, you have to do a leg to the ground. Sometimes you'll have a situation on the fire escape that's bad, that's bracketed and you don't trust the wall, as soon as you put a leg to the ground, you've eliminated the concern in the wall. Got it? Because now my building's a leg, my leg is a leg, and I don't need the bracket anymore. Got it? Barbed wire? Okay, so there's various violations that you're breaking now when you stop putting barbed wire in certain areas. 
So just be aware that fire escapes, because of breaking issues, people started getting creative, broken glass, you know, razor blade, barbed wire, you know, nails in the stud, spring loaded backwards, you know, what all are illegal things, you know. There's ways to keep people off your fire escape. Trucks smashing into your building, a lot of times they'll blow out the, the veneer. But where's the real damage? Inside. Inside, inside on the masonry, right? Because is the fire escape tied into the veneer or just goes through the veneer? Through. <laughs> goes through the veneer. This is a wood structure, guys. All wood structures in the United States must have a through bolt. So 100% nine, nine, of all wood structures have a through bolt. 95% of all the fire escapes in the U.S. have a, a pocketed cement, but 5% of the, of the fire escapes in the masonry buildings do have a through bolt. But it's primarily uh, factories, mills. They'll have the they'll have the plate on the inside. Through bolt in the fire All all wood structures, and, and here's, when I, if you guys are going to get into this, am I building a wood structure? So all wood fire escapes have laid to the ground, there's no need for through bolts. But what I recommend highly to anybody who's going to allow somebody for a reduced cost to put up a wooden fire escape that's two inches thick in all directions, your treads, your sides, built to 100 pounds per square foot, is have the, the carpenter build through an iron worker, build the the brackets out of steel and then add wood to it. Mm -hmm. So the main two supports that you're going to be putting your starting platform should be a metal frame through bolted into the building and he frames his whole deck, rails, stairs going down to meet his 100 pounds per square foot. Is that a, on that lower, is that a lag bolt? That lag screw, there's no such thing as a lag bolt. I got pulled my ear, my ears got pulled by a guy who made sure I knew that. And there's no such thing as a lag bolt, there's a lag screw. It's just a position it. That's just a positioner. But the key, if you see any fire escape, you walk up to a building and there's three or four lag screws in that bracket, does it have a through bolt? No. So that's the giveaway. When you see a lot of lag screws, there's no through bolt, it's illegal, she's gonna pull away from the building. So all wood structures must have a through bolt. Otherwise, if I can't get back in here and put that because now they got all finished work inside here and there's no way to get to it anymore, as soon as I put a leg on this to the ground, what happens? Do I need that anymore? No, no. Because the building is a leg, the leg is a leg, and what do I have? A bridge. Got it? How do I fix that? What? That one there, the um, back of slide? Yeah, you're going to have to put a bigger plate. Well, the, wasn't there a window up there or something? Yeah, it, it, it's a factory. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you basically put a new through bolt and you put a plate capturing more. That's just that the load is too concentrated. It's yeah. ripping right through. It's, it's crushing the brick because the, the, the cast iron donut is too small. So a lot of times the plate on the inside is four by eight plate picking up a stud. Or sometimes underneath the window they'll pick up the king stud and the other king stud. And there'll be a thing all the way across and then you kind of bury it in there. A so, lot of times in between the two two by, you know, two by uh, four sixteens on center, mm -hmm. you do all the blocking in there, and then you put the plate on the on the blocking. So can you give us like a rule of thumb thickness or of the steel and like yeah. the size of the plate that would work? Yeah, a rule of thumb. You know, it's, again, you, you gotta pick up one stud for this side, you gotta pick up one stud on that side, and you gotta, or you're going to pick all the studs up accordingly. And it's usually, a, uh, you know, a, they want to go with half inch thick, usually plate, four by eight plate. Sometimes you can do an eight by eight plate. Because don't forget, it's what are you picking up? So some guys mistakenly put it in between the two sixteens and all they're doing is putting pressure against the three quarter wood on the outside. It's supposed to pick up a stud, so that's why every now and then, between the two, two by sixteens, I mean two by fours, 16 on center, you, you basically double up two 2 by 10s in there, toenail it this way, then you through bolt through here and you put the plate inside here. So now you're picking up two, you, you gotta rip out two, uh, two by fours, but you pick up the king on this side of the window, pick up the king on this other side of the window with both individual, but sometimes on some windows that you're not doing that, you just run up. Some owners, they don't give a shit, they'll just put a, a, a piece of four by, uh, 32 inch flat, exposed, you know, on the outside. 
They don't care what it looks like to the tenants because they don't like the tenants. You know, you know they, a lot of people, it's dressed and it's nice and tight inside and non visible. Some you get there and the, the through bolt is right there. I mean, the plate is right outside exposed. Cantilevers. We're going to talk about another life safety issue cantilevers with a chain. And this is, I'm going to show you why. If you have a cantilever in your city with a chain on it, it's a life safety issue. Okay, so here's how they're supposed to be built. Single action requiring no special knowledge. Got it? So I am a woman coming here with a 150 pound woman with a 50 pound child. So this is, a, this is scenario number one. I get to this bar that's called a release bar and it's blocking my way. But whether I know what to do or not and I run through it, what happens? It rotates, right? As it rotates coming down here, there's a little six inch piece that's holding my cantilever that wants to go up. So as soon as it rotates away, what's it let the cantilever do? Let's it drop two to three feet per second, hit the ground and stay down. So single action required no special knowledge. I go through that, it rotates, it rotates here, releasing this. This cantilever, which is two thirds, one third, right there on the nose, it weighs 25 pounds more. So not only does it come down two to three feet per second, if I want to throw it back up, how easy is it for me? Perfectly balanced, only weighs 25 pounds, so I can grab the nose. Somebody up above can grab the arm. When I throw it up, it goes up, and what does somebody upstairs do? Resets it. Got it? It's ready for the next emergency years later. Got it? That's how it works. And so when the mom comes down with the daughter in tow, through here, so by the time she gets here, this thing's already in a down position, and she self-evacuates. Single action, requiring no special knowledge. She uses it, she doesn't need you. Whether you show up a minute, 10 minutes, or an hour later, what's the, what's the tenant have to do with the situation? Nothing, right? Now, scenario number two, you, you have a cantilever in your city that was the nose was starting to get to the sky because the weight box full of crap in the back was starting to fill with water and, and rust grows and gets heavy. And so when it gets heavy, what do you do? What happens to the nose? You as a fire official or a building official walk in the alleyways, you see this thing starting to point to the sky. What do you write? Fail. You write a violation, right? He calls around and says, how much to fix this out of balance candle? But somebody says, oh, $3,000. $3,000, you crazy? So he goes to Home Depot with 30 bucks and what's he buy? Exactly. Chain. And he takes chain and he ties it over here and he takes chain and he ties it up there and he makes it horizontal. And he calls you and says, hey, I took care of the problem. He goes, oh, is it aiming to the sky anymore? He says, no. You took care of it? Took care of it. So it's out of balance, right? In the wrong direction, right? So every fire escape that has a chain on the back, if you were to cut that chain, what happens to the candle? What will it do? So is that a life safety issue? Yes. Cool. So every chain you're now going to see on a cantilever is a life safety issue, right? So the woman comes down. There is no release arm there because it's out of balance. So a lot of times, what do they, what do, they do with these release arms when they put a chain on it? Cut them off. Disable them. Right. So they cut them away. So now she comes down, 150 pounds, 50 pound child behind her, and she starts going up two, three steps. What happens? Nothing. Nothing. Sorry. It's weighted backwards. Right. She goes three to five steps. What happens? Nothing. Nothing. But she goes out five to eight steps. What happens? Goes down. Put 150 pounds. It's more than enough to start the process. Two to three feet per second, or five to ten feet per second. Five to ten. Five to ten, this thing comes down, slams on the ground, and she is possibly gonna go that way, but because the thing is falling, what's your tendency? Lean forward or kick back? When she kicks back, knocks her daughter down, this thing slams the ground, she screams without her cries, and it hits the ground. And now where's it gonna stay? It's gonna stay on the ground, because she's where? She's eight steps down. She tells her daughter to stop crying, she, and both of them are in their PJs, right? And she goes further down, daughter in tow, 
She steps 150 pounds off the cantilever, and what happens? Her daughter goes up now. Her daughter's now up 12 to 14 feet in the air because cantilevers are 12 to 14 feet for what reason? Security. Trucks, garbage trucks, right? In alleyways, that's why they're 12 to 14, so that trucks don't smash into them. They have to be that high. So, kids up there can't get she's up there, the daughter's up there, and she tells the daughter to do what? Jump. And the daughter does what? Jumps. Doesn't jump. So, she runs back down the alleyway to go in the front of the building in her PJs, and she forgets what? The keys. To open up what? So she tries to grab something in the air to do what? Smash the window to get back in and go back into a burning building, right? You guys show up then, right? You say, what are you doing, crazy lady out here in your PJs? She goes, oh, my daughter. So you guys run down the alleyway and tell the daughter to do what? Jump. Jump. The daughter says what? No. So you guys run back to your fire truck and go get the pole. Hi, boy. Yeah. Go up there and grab it and pull it down. Put your foot on it. Reunite mom and the daughter, right? And they get away. What do you do with your foot? Take it off. If you do that, what happens? Pipe pole goes up in the air. So what do you do? What's that guy do? <laughs> you just lost one guy to do what? Pull the ladder down. Hold the thing down. Is that how it's supposed to be? Is that single action requiring no special knowledge? So every fire escape can leave with a chain has been modified by the owner to avoid a violation, balance backwards, and is it a life safety issue? Yes. So some of these with no release arms, they can get quickly out of balance when you get a lot of snow like you guys just got down. When pigeons land, can you get over 25 pounds of pigeons on one end to bring it down? Yeah. So that's why people put in these release arms to keep them perfectly horizontal. Or they start putting weights on the back and the chain to basically always hold it horizontal. Snow, ice, pigeons. So now, Here's what it looks like. Is that chain correctly put in to a place that it should be? No. And does that bracket, can that bracket handle the load of the impact when this thing comes down? No, no, no. That release arm is fully open. Is this thing doing anything? That's no good. Is this a life safety issue? Yeah. Is this a life safety issue? Yes. So trash trucks, people smashing into these things. As soon as you see things that just doesn't look right, Right? Life safety issue. Trash trucks. See the chain right there? So not only did it smash, it still has a, uh, uh, the chain on it. So as soon as you lose a cantilever for any reason, can people self-evacuate? Uh, self no. So they're trapped on the upper floors. And when you show up to fight the fire, what's the first? Is it a firefight or a rescue mission? Rescue. So is that what you want to be doing? So is this a life safety issue? Minutes count? People are dead? Moving trucks, trash trucks, they do this all the time. What's the immediate answer to make this functional? That night so that all 50 people can go back into the building? Scaffolding back here somewhere? Staircases. So not only your treads are problems, the fire escape is not properly attached at the top, properly attached at the bottom, you can lose a whole staircase, not just a tread. So if the stringer at the very top is full of rust, you're losing the tread or you're losing the staircase? Staircase. This is a, a hotel, a 24-story hotel in Chicago, eight stories up, with a zoom lens. I took this photo. <laughs> how long has that rust been growing? Look how much rust is here. Look how much rust is there. A lot of this is because of leaves and trees throwing additional accumulation, organic material in that area, and it just accelerates the rust. Okay? These things, when, these threads, when these threads start falling by themselves, look how much was eaten before snow dropped these threads. When threads look like this, snow actually made these things fall. This is just your kids backing up the family car. <laughs> Dad, I have something to tell you. <laughs> railings, all welded railings, guys. They're all going to need a bolt. Every welded connection needs an x-ray or load test, mandatory. Or, pop a bolt, no 
low test needed. So rust, whenever you get a sandwich of anything, guys, it'll always accumulate rust, unless you clean it, prime it, silicone it. Did anybody use silicone 50 to 75 years ago? Mm -hmm. Today, every connection that gets repaired must have silicone in it. And a lot of your codes state that. It says you must put in some preventive product in the connection to prevent future corrosion. Okay? In Chicago, you know how long, how often they want you to paint your fire escape? By law, every three years. In a lot of the, in New England, we use the slats on, on end like that. And the way you keep the spacing every one inch is with these little spacers that have a three, uh, that had a quarter inch rod with one inch spacer little tubes, and they rod from the inside out. Can I fix them? Can I reinforce it by putting a piece of flat on the knee, a flat on top, right next to this, and then mechanically create a sandwich? Yes. yes. Can I keep this grading for another 20 years mm -hmm. with a reinforcement? Mm -hmm. Is there other evidence of strength? Mm -hmm. Right? Got it? So can you save transit grading with these clips? Yes. So it's not about throwing away stuff. You've got some more mileage on these things. So anywhere there's a sandwich, there's rust. So yeah, you got to clean it and they got to fill it. Because all those cracks and cran crannies from ice jacking and rust jacking, when you put it all back together, she won't close anymore. So what do you fill it with? Silicone. Cocking. 35 year paintable, which is a latex silicone, or 50 year silicone, but it's not paintable. So you can only put it on black fire escapes and so you got to sort of choose which one you're going to use accordingly. See the treads? If I don't get these spacers, see this one piece of flat here on the nose? That's the one that's going to give way and make you trip going down the stairs or going up the stairs. But as soon as I put that reinforcement that basically grabs the tail, grabs the nose, and creates a mechanical sandwich, we can use these treads for another 20 years, okay? Treads. Sea salt. This is a school by the ocean. You let it go, 25 years. If somebody didn't see this today, they didn't see it for 25 years. One inch of rust, why? A lot of times, it's what side of the building it's on, is it staying wet all the time? Is there a, 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 a gutter above it feeding water to it every day? Ladders, you guys got some situations uh, that ladders were modified and they create a flop out ladder. I don't know if you guys have ever gotten one of those. The flop-out ladders are, are a problem, which I'll talk about in a second. In California, they have sliding ladders. You know why we can't have these here? They'll freeze up. Okay. They'll freeze up. So in areas that are warmer, you can have these kind of ladders. In areas that are warmer, you can have these kind of ladders. It's called accordion ladders. Yeah. Again, they're pre-existing non-conforming, but when you release them, they open up like an accordion. 15 to 25 feet. Fixed ladders, right? So if I get, I'm looking at a building in your city and it ends seven feet from the ground. Is it a violation? Yes. Yeah. Yep, it's supposed to be all the way to grade. So you can put in a slider on this so that it slides the rest of the way. You can take this ladder out and put a fold out ladder that only operates from above. Or you can take this ladder out and do a complete stand to the ground. What does that ladder have to be hooked with? Through bolts? Uh, no, lack screw. You can just lack screw directly to the bottom. Because it has two there, two there, two there, and there's usually the spacing is even less. Even though it's a wood building? Yeah. It's just lack screw. They're not required to be lag, uh, lag I mean, uh, through bolted. Through bolted. Huh. The brackets are through bolted. Right. The brackets are through bolted. And because it's permanent to the ground, it's supposed to have, you know, sitting on the ground. So, right. But, yeah. So. So this is what a balanced one looks like, see? So everything's up, it's got pulleys, it's got cables, and a lot of times these things are on a track of some kind, so in case the cable breaks, they don't fall down to the ground and conk somebody in the head. Goosenecks, you guys got a lot of goosenecks that everybody's scared about. Well, that, with that one year walkthrough by the, uh, by the agent, <laughs> guess who's going over the goosenecks? Landlord. <laughs> Landlord, agent, or other, right? Now your rookies, you guys are going to send your rookies out there, right? These are the flop outs. These used to be single ladders fixed that ended seven feet from the ground. People were breaking into the building, so somebody went there and chopped it, 
and basically folded half of the back. It's illegal. It's a life safety concern because when you release it or the wind blows it, because usually they have a chain on it, they're supposed to let it out by hand. Is that single action requiring no special knowledge? Mm. So when this thing flops out and it comes down, it'll cock somebody on the head down below and it'll kill or maim them. So this is what it looks like when, when it's down. Illegal. Can't have these. So this ladder needs to be put back on the wall permanently and if they're worried about break-ins, they can either have a fold up, a slide down, or a permanent stair with a cage around it but they can't have this anymore. Cantilevers. You see what happens when they get out of balance? Will you write a violation if you're walking down the alleyway? You see that? See what, as it starts to show you? So 30 bucks and a chain. I'll remove your violation. I won't fix it right, but I'll remove your violation. I want to show you the million dollar reason, a million reasons why every well that you'll ever encounter in your state on a fire escape, you will put a bolt through it. So this is a cantilever that in the city of Chicago, you see all the other activity going on? All the ropes and everything? There's a uh, masonry company doing the whole restoration. You get that a lot in your old buildings, masonry companies? And they come in and use the fire escape? Can they use the fire escape as a a working platform if it's just been recently certified? Should well, they? Sure. they can use it with permission as long as they take the fire escape offline. It's still usable, but they basically own it now while they're doing everything that they're doing. But let's show you how violent it is. Two to three feet per second. Hit the ground, stay down. See all that torquing and wiggling? Yeah. Right? Well, there was a piece of steel on this thing that when we refurbished this whole fire escape system, that piece of steel was pristine, didn't have any bulbs, didn't have any rust, didn't have any tears. You know what fell on some guy's head that was using this fire escape? And they would do this 10 to 15 times a day for two to three months? Guess what fell off that? That weight? That piece of metal that was welded, it broke, conked the guy in the head. Did he have his helmet on? No. <laughs> so that guy sued everybody. He sued, took seven years for this lawsuit to finally get through. Cost a million dollars. Not 27, which was originally what he wanted. I'll have to explain why. While we were doing this, this trash truck, I mean, this uh, cement truck showed up. So that's good, right? That I can show you why things are 12 to 14 feet. Right. But look as he goes up to underneath this one. Look at the chain. So why does this hotel, the hotel that had that eight foot piece of steel coming out, you know, the staircase coming up? See that right there? Yeah. See that chain? Because if it didn't have the chain and it was slightly down, what would be yeah. happening to every one of these cantilevers when these guys back up? looking in the rear view mirror. They're looking up or they're looking back? Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> it's just backing up. And they hit it, they don't care. You know what I'm saying? So that's why it chains. So now I drop it again, look how violent that is. So that torquing, guess what snapped off that 15th piece? So now the guy wanted $27 million. He sued everybody. He sued me, the iron worker that did all the work. He sued the, uh, the guys who signed off, the architect that signed off, the management company, the owner of the, of the building, the, the, um, the shoe store that rented the building, and he sued the city of Chicago. Why? Because what we signed when we were done with this was to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief. Right? So here he's going, and it's almost in the seventh year, claiming that he was all broken up and he really couldn't think. And, and so just this past summer, they, they sent a private investigator to chase him, and he was in a field doing what? Playing soccer, volleyball, and all those things that you're not supposed to be doing when you're... So, instead of 27 million, he got more than 1 million. I asked my lawyer, why are you still giving him a million? He goes, because he still got cocked in the head. So, the point of that is everybody's going to be matched. Philadelphia, the city going to get involved in this lawsuit? Colorado Springs, city involved. Mm -hmm. So you accept an opinion letter, you're also accepting what? Liability. Because who, who smarter than you as a city? Isn't it, the, it, no, isn't it that, that design professional who wrote you a letter that says, here's an opinion and to the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, and you say, I'll take that. I'll put it, what did you just assume? You just assumed the liability for it. Got it? So, but the code, NFPA says, I'll accept by low test, any liability with a low test? None. Because you, you did what the code said, right? 
It was a load tested. Any liability for you, the owner, or the, the design professional? After it passes a load test? Or there's the or, other satisfactory evidence of strength, but will you accept an opinion letter? With an attached what? So if you accept an opinion letter, what do you want? What do you also want with that? Load test. test. Or what's the other version of other satisfactory evidence of strength? Full refer with tie backs into the building verified. What, what do you get there? And if something does happen catastrophic two to three years from now, and a bolt shear, who's everybody suing? The bolt company. It was a product defect. Got it? It's all about shipping liability. So, is there answers for all your mansions and all your buildings? That could be staircases, that could be spirals. This is a YMCA. The only space I had to stick this thing in was right there. That's what we did. Okay? A spiral. So, can spirals be the answer? Can ladders still be an answer? When you've exhausted all means of putting in a traditional stair, spirals kick in and ladders keep start creeping back in as possibilities whenever there's a lack of space. Got it? So where are we going to start this? This is a five-year program, guys. You don't think you're going to walk out of here and start this overnight, but you're going to get the ball rolling. And with the ball rolling, it usually takes three to five years to get something going. So as we start working with you and work with industry standard documentation, start getting all the partnerships back together so that the health, the housing, the building, the fire, and anybody else associated with the, all these structures have, all have automatic triggers or checklist items on their thing, what's going to happen? It'll take three to five years to get this under control. Through your local ordinance, you, are, you force the five-year rule. Through the local ordinance, you, you make sure all your fire escapes get tagged. You, can, you continue doing training. So not only do we do this training today, a year or two from now, we do additional training, but now we start inviting vendors and engineers into this class who are doing stuff in your city but like not still not getting it, you know what I'm saying? So you bring them in. So we did that with Portland, Oregon. We had 150 people in the class and it had fire officials, building officials, um, general, uh, what do you call it, design professionals and vendors and painters who were in the class. And there was nothing better than everybody like, well, I'm only doing this. And like, well, then you're going to accept that? And so it became one of these rules that as people said, this is what I'm going to do. I just said, well, will you accept that? And what, what will you guys want? Because there was a lot of like, hey, I don't want to carry all the burden here. So that's what they, so that class got recorded and it's online. So we have our class here. Believe me, the vendors and the engineers need to be pulled into a future class in about two to three years. Okay? This is what's called a downtown walk around. We don't have to go to code, do we? We already have the code, right? How many people are you partnered up with now? One. Right? Who else do you have on your side? OSHA. Right? OSHA. Confidence test. There's confidence tests everywhere now. So if somebody tells you, is this, a, is this a state document that you're making me sign? What do you say to them? This is an industry standard confidence test that has standard questions, both related to the general structure and to the physical structural components. All right, so all of the questionnaires, yes, no, no more opinions. There's the yearly. This is all Boston wants for me. To the best of my information, I always believe the fire escape is in conformity with the mass building code. So do you think this, you know, just because I come from Boston, Boston is it's working? But you go outside of Boston, they're following these rules. But sometimes what happens with the king and his castle? They're the last to change it. Got it, to conform, but that's okay. I've gotten more done from a grassroots level than I've done from a state level. So, confidence tests, we'll send you these, or you can go online, if you go to, you go to uh, National Firescape Association, you go on the documents, you can actually download the PDFs directly there. Checklist, here's that tax letter. City of Lowell, they send out with the tax letter, say, hi, City of Lowell, you know, we're concerned about your safety. If you, everybody got this letter, but if you own a structure in my city that has a fire escape, there's a law associated with it, I need a, I need a certificate within the next 30 days. So with regular mailings that go out, what can you put in? Notice of egress that says, by the way, to not offend the building department, the fire department, the health department, the housing department, 
you should have a confidence, that you should have a certificate of your fire escape egress if it's outside on file with us immediately. Otherwise, fines, fees, and penalties will start in the very near future, and we are going to start holding paychecks, money, rents. The best one that I think that we've worked with all over the country that has a, a model to copy, Portland, Oregon. They're about 95% of what uh, I think should be. They have tags, confidence tests. Um, they even tell you what paint to use. And you didn't see that, but one of the issues, they have some flaws. They still talk about welding. And I reminded them, guys, welding, EPA, you can't. Sandblasting changes the whole, every, nobody, you just can't sandblast, because now OSHA is involved in sandblasting. And sandblasting is the cost of replacing the fire escapes one or two times over. So it's a good idea. Confidence says yes, no questions. Tags, they're all out there, but they're great. So we're starting a tagging program, and we're tying it in with your fire department trainees. And you're going to make all those rookies do what? Go out and find them and put what colors on them? Yellows and reds. And find fire escapes where they never thought there was a fire escape. Yeah, downtown walk arounds. Yep, yeah, 123 Main Street does have one. This one does not have one. And every now and then you've got to find some situations. We have buildings that used to have a fire escape, but guess what they did? Took them off. And guess what they forgot to tell? <laughs> or you're going to get there and there's fire escapes and the stairs have been removed, the balconies are still there, and what did they forget to tell you? that those are supposed to be complete to grade, so the fire escape stairs need to be, but they turn them into waiting balconies for, for plants and, and fruit. Going down alleyway, you're going to clearly see when the next date is. You're trying to avoid people getting killed. You're trying to avoid this that happened in Philadelphia, which you will be sorry video over here. In this hand grenade just went off in Philadelphia. You've got a bunch of hand grenades Witnesses in your area. like an incredible explosion when the fire escape. This is you. This is every city in Massachusetts. It doesn't have to be Philly. Philly is representing you right now. That's all. Tell that to your mayor. Say, hey, this is, we have a bunch of these hand grenades now as we speak. Ready? All exterior steel wooden stairs. Is this an exterior steel wooden stair? Well, I'm just saying. Does it fit into the category of an exterior steel wooden stair? Yep. Exterior steel wooden stairs? Right. Exterior steel wooden stairs? Because we now are going to start getting into some farm machinery. We're going to start getting into some oil refineries. You're going to get into some, some uh, signage. How about these uh, waiting balconies? Are these exterior steel wooden stairs bridges exposed to the weather? Do they need to be examined? and load tested. Hotels sometimes have these external walkways that go back into the room that end in a stair. Is that an exterior steel wooden stair in all these motels, ramadas, pine in local something whatever? How do you get into every single one of those? Through a long catwalk with a stair on either side. These waiting balconies. So you guys uh, you guys, how about these porches on the back of buildings that have the stairs inside the porch? Is this a second means of egress? Is this a fire escape? Or both? Is it an exterior steel wooden stair? Is this an exterior steel wooden stair? Somebody asked me, how, how many feet off the ground before you start calling it an exterior steel wooden stair? Well, can you hurt yourself on five feet? Yes. So all exterior steel or wooden stairs. Spirals, decks. So this is one of those. Let's say that was a an apartment complex, and that is my apartment complex. Now, did I just make my deck and the staircase need to be 100 pounds per square foot? So some of these that got built got built to 60 pounds per square foot when they actually needed to be 100. Some of the decking on this is three quarter. I mean five quarter. In order to satisfy, I need to beef up the structure, and I need to add another five quarter on top to meet the inch and a half nominal. So this is that wood question that came up. Can fire escapes be made out of wood? They already are. 
This is a typical fire escape right here. Couches and, and fridges go up and down, but this is only three, five quarter wood. Built to 60 pounds. Exterior still wouldn't stare. So on a case by case basis, you'll get, you'll start getting this under control. Handicap ramps. It's a bridge. Must be examined. Machinery, refineries. Don't you guys go up and deal with those when there's a fire? Uh, mechanical equipment, catwalks, roof, siding, uh, not siding, but uh, signage. Bridge overs. Um, skywalks for, ho uh, for hotels and or institutions. How about this problem? People with a fixed ladder outside their window. Is that legal? Mm -hmm. Somebody shoehorned that in. So that means somebody made this a three-family home, and that's what their answer is to, to uh, is that single action requiring no special knowledge. Now, you put a platform out there, and you make a legal ladder to the ground, right? It's legal. But what happens if they never pulled a permit to have this? What can you order upon them? Because they never pulled a permit to make that in into a three-family, or they shoehorn this thing in, but it's been 22 years that this thing's been like this. Can you make them put a door where the window is, full staircase to the ground, because they never pulled a permit? Not them. Somebody else who sold it to them. Or can you work with them and say, you know what, I'm going to work with you. I need a platform, and I need that ladder system all the way to grade. So that usually means a platform there, another platform here, because I can't have over 25 feet a fall for a ladder, you know what I'm saying? And so you basically have a platform to another platform to, a, uh, and to another, another ladder to the ground, if you allow it. Otherwise, full metal stairs coming out of the door to the grave because these people piss you off for some reason. Spirals. Got it? If it's exterior, it must be maintained. Ready? You're the only known uh, slidescape that I know in the, in the U.S. 12-story uh, slidescape. This is Elizabeth, New Jersey, and I told you, we trained 400 of their firemen to basically go out and start spotting fire escapes, okay? This is on the roof, which is right there. And this is when you open up these two doors that are two orange doors on every floor, because they only have one stair, one elevator shaft in that Art Deco building built in 1905. When the two doors open, <coughs> This is what you're looking at. This is what you jump in, and it goes like this. Corkscrews for 12 floors. With other people joining the party, by the way, as you're going down, there's other people perfectly timing themselves to, to basically go in head first, feet first. And what you do is you come all the way down, and then when you hit down here about, the, about this floor, it takes a wicked left turn and it just goes straight for about 25 feet and you go sliding down this kid slide because it's about three feet wide and your feet are supposed to hit this paddle on this old iron door that swings wide open and you tumble out into the street down here. Is that fire guy holding them back? <laughs> What they actually did is because the, the door at the ground, could, we couldn't open the door at the ground, they called in a rookie. Any rookies here? Is that somebody pointing to a rookie? A rookie training or anybody? And they had a rookie go in from the second floor on a row down and kick the door open. And any snakes and dead raccoons that they had there. But you see this? Corkscrew all the way down, 12 stories. Still an operation? Yes. Still that means egress. And by the way, you were talking about some of the schools and stuff. This is what used to be nice. slidescapes all over the country oh, before yeah. they got rid of every single one of them. Wow, well, looks like a trash tunnel. Yep. Now you can imagine why they got rid of them, because kids were doing this every day. Every day. And that's how you got back into school. You snuck into school through the fire escape. Sure. This is that fold-out ladder that they sell if you want to buy one for your single-family home that basically when it closes, it's pivoting on both, both bars. And it closed, looks like a drain pipe, but when you open it, it opens up. 
So see pivots there, pivots there. But they also have these bag ladders, which are not legal. Bag ladders are not legal, and these ladders are not legal as a second means of egress if you buy it and install it yourself. But it can be a legal third means of egress. Or if I get to a fire escape and it has a ladder, and I can put, the, I want to change that fixed ladder to one of these fall downs, then you're legal. So you can't buy one and make it part of your situation. You can buy it yourself and install it for a third means of egress, but it won't satisfy your second means. Guys, we've been talking about the dinosaurs, and we're almost at the end. These last two things are the end of the show, right? So they, the standard fire escape system has always allowed people to self-evacuate. But one of the problems that we've had now is some buildings, especially on tall or high rise, if people get trapped, they can't come down, how do you go up and still evacuate? Two to four thousand dollars, you can have this in your fire truck. Or they can have these as standard in some of these high rise buildings over seven stories so that people can self-evacuate or you guys can get to the building and help them self-evacuate because people can't come down anymore. Okay? That's two to four thousand. Then the next one right after it is two to four million dollars and basically it's a third means of egress but more of a elevator system that you can add to a building that's going up brand new or an old building that's in downtown and they want a third means of egress. These are the two things that are now available. And have been well, if you live in a high-rise building, you probably at least wondered how you would get out of there if there was a fire. Those fears became all too real for thousands of Americans on September 11th. Many were trapped in the World Trade Center towers as the floors below them burned. Well, now inventors are working on new technology to help people get out alive. Ariadzer has a look at one invention. Go ahead, step up. And down he goes. Looks simple, and it is. The Recover All High Rise Evacuation System being tested on this day by firefighters. I think this is impressive. It's, it's, it's pretty easy to set up, it's easy to use, it's hand-free operation, it's self-contained. Uh, I think it'll work. Our equipment was designed specifically to be used by senior citizens, by children. That's why we chose a device that is fully automatic in, in operation. That's why we enclosed the victim inside a full coverage suit which eliminates the fear of heights. The first step for evacuation is putting on the big suit. Kind of makes you look like a baked potato, but this actually protects you from heat and flames if you're in a real fire situation. The firefighters let us go for a test ride. Picture one of these machines on your condo balcony ready to use, or in your high-rise office stored away for an emergency. It buys you the time to escape. We are six floors up. Once you push back and let go, the machine lowers you gently to the ground at the rate of three feet per second. The ride is smooth all the way down. You never speed up, you never slow down. It keeps you at that same rate all the way down to the ground. So the obvious question on everyone's mind is, would this system have made any difference in the World Trade Center disaster? My personal opinion is this would have saved So this is something that all occupants can buy and install in their building or you can bring to a fire because it basically uses compression technology between two floors. Okay? And you set up the people and you evacuate them out of any window that you want on a high rise. Here's the two to four million dollar answer. So that in case somebody's building a, a 10, 20 story building in your city and they're spending 50 million dollars already, they may want this third means of egress as an option in case you can't get people down to the ground floor. So this is, this is a 22 story building in Israel that has this system. Operational and, and controlled by the fire department only. Now, this is all because they can't come down the normal way. There's been a problem at the building, and everybody's starting to evacuate up the building. As you can see, the key here is the collapsible uh, pieces. They bring in five, five, five to ten firemen into the building through this means. Even uneven floors can be dealt with. Multiple evacuations on all floors by a fireman assisting everybody back into these boxes. multiple floors, ground level or even if it's a window situation, everything can be modified. 
So now the firemen stay behind, start to fight the fire, and get the next crowd ready or do whatever they have to do to fight the fire. And basically all these people are on these systems coming back down. And again, they couldn't come down the normal means, meaning something happened on the second or third floor that blocked all ability to come back down. And everybody was starting to go up the building. Now, would have this helped out in the 9-11? In the, uh, in, in, uh, the answer is yes, because as everybody went up, this is how they would have got them down. But again, this is not a second means of egress, this is a third means of egress. The only option you have here is basically it's two to four million bucks. But sometimes this is a bargaining chip, you know, because you guys are adding sprinklers, better alarms. This, this could be one of the suggestions that you make to somebody willing to put a $50 million or $100 million into your downtown. You say, would you consider, you know, a third means of egress in case something happens down below and everybody has to go up? This is one of the approved answers out there, okay? So let's take a look at this uh, as we sort of get to the very end of this. And look, good. we're just, and we're good. So, the question now really lies on what do you guys want to do with this? Because a lot of these classes are just this. They're classes you go away and you'll never do a damn thing about this. Or it's the, the part where we start uh, looking at um, the slow lean forward because you're going to get pushed back. So my recommendation is that you all get into your positions, lean forward a little bit. So that way in case you fall, you fall where? Forward. And, every, and then you get yourself up just one more step ahead. It's going to take three to five years to get this really going. You need to practice one fire escape at a time. You need to have somebody in your area that's really the fire escape guy. Sometimes you're the only guy. Anyway, so we're already working. We have industry standard documentation that we can send you, or you can go online and get it all. It's the same information. So whether we give it to you or you go get it, it's the same information. We can custom make uh, some of these for you, or because you get it in PDF and or Word, you modify it anyway. So if your legal department sees something that they don't like, it doesn't matter. Just take it out and copy and paste what you want into your own language, into your own city letterhead, if that's what makes the mayor happy, great. Your main point is that you have now just realized that you're not alone in this quest. There's five other people that the city or the mayor or anybody has to push back. They're going to push back the fire department. Well, now they're pushing the building department, pushing the housing department, pushing the, the health department, pushing the safety, you know, the general safety of the, and the well-being of your people. So tax letters, uh, triggers, you know, you got, you got a lot of things. So you really don't have to really, you know, pull up a flag. Because you put up a flag, they're going to shoot you down. But if all of a sudden you start working with all your departments and ask them, and the easiest one is your building permit. Those are people doing something to a building with money they already have in their pocket. And if the fire escape, instead of, instead of being the last thing they touch, it now becomes the first thing. And that's in the full renovation of a building. But if they're just changing a light bulb and they got an electrical permit, they're changing a toilet, they fell into the trigger. And then all you're doing is asking for a copy and the clock is started, that's all. And for those slumlords and those people that are going to ignore you anyway, you want to think about fines and fees and penalties because if you finally resolve that issue 14 months from now, they have 14 months of fines, fees, and penalties because as soon as you put it into the computer system, there's per diems that you have. Got it? So this is the end of the class. If you have any questions, it can either be now. Well, if you have any questions, you all have my card. Did everybody grab one of the cards? That, that 888 goes directly to myself. And if you have any case studies, you know. So I recommend everybody pick three to five fire escape systems in your uh, before, during, or afters that are coming. And just send me photographs, send me pictures. And, and if you've got something that happened in the past that you'd like to get a second look at it, we don't charge. Again, everything is funded through Fire Escape Engineers, funds the National Fire Escape Association. So that's why we're doing this class for free. You know what I'm saying? So um, if you have any questions, that's, we're, we're basically here to help you basically get ready because when we're in your city, we're going to do it right. But when we're not in your city and somebody else is doing it, guess what's going to happen? It's going to get done right. And somebody's going to do it. Out of all of it, if we don't do it, somebody will do it. That's all. And whoever does that will help, hopefully be up against somebody like yourself as a new sheriff in town saying, here's how it's really done. And by the way, in case I forget, there's 600 videos online now of classes done 
including the latest one on Valentine's Day. And hopefully all of you have bought your chocolates. Hmm. Your flowers. Flowers and chocolates. Cisco, do you have a membership side of this too, where people become a member? Of I, I have, it's on, it's, uh, the membership side is just the way that I work with associations, but this, my intention into the future is to make, which it's not now, a nonprofit, is to make Firescape, um, uh, the National Firescape Association a nonprofit that's run really by the city officials. Uh, but right now, because it's not, we haven't got that status, so we don't receive money and we don't, uh, we don't have a, a controlling, uh, you know, a board as of yet, but we're only a couple of years old. I only started this a couple of years back when I was, I had all this information and no place to put it. And whenever I used to come out and say, hi, I'm Firescape Services, I want to tell you stuff, they're like, you selfish bastard, you just want to sell Firescape. So we started the National Firescape Association, put all this for free of charge on there. So your class, when you go to the National Firescape Association, will be a clickable thing. So any of your trainees go there, in case you don't have a download, just click on there or you go onto YouTube and you type in Firescape Seminar, New Hampshire. This one goes up and uh, has anybody, was anybody here in my last class? Okay, so there's another class that was done in this very same room. It's already online, it's been online for two years and none of you knew about it. And it was a six hour course. But then they didn't have any fatalities in Philadelphia, Colorado, and Chicago. So today you have fatalities that's happened just in the month of January. So basically what we're saying is it's now getting to the point where things are, people are dying and you don't want to be the one that kind of knew that it could have happened and you did nothing about it. Got it? Any other questions? Otherwise I'll be here for a few more minutes after this. If you guys want to come and see me and talk to me, thanks a lot for coming to the class. Thank you.